Formula E returned to London again after a five-year absence and took no half measures in ensuring everyone took notice. They could have raced around the streets again. They could have gone back to the park. But instead, the circus chose here. With a massive 22 corners, this 2.25 kilometer track sits literally in and around the XL Exhibition Center, planted in the artificial docks in the borough of Newham. Flanked by City Airport on the wonderful driverless DLR, across from the giant dome of the O2 and the skyscraping trading block of Docklands, this particular area of London is home to a diversity of happenings and people. Including me. I live literally up the road. As we'll soon see, this track is weird and fascinating and a hell of a project to put together. With a huge exhibition center in the middle, railway tracks bordering the north and water to the south, they've had to do quite a lot in a surprisingly constrained amount of space. Why did they do it here? And more importantly, how did they pull it off? So join me, won't you, as we discover how the hell you transform part of a city into a Formula E race. But no matter where the racing goes, be it an exhibition centre or at a custom-built circuit on the outskirts of Rambleshank Nowhere, you can connect securely to one of the thousands of super-fast worldwide servers brought to you by today's sponsor, NordVPN. To me, the key part of NordVPN service is being able to virtually place yourself around the world so your connection acts as if it's in America, France, North Macedonia. So if you want to subscribe to a sports streaming service in Canada and or watch Bosnia and Herzegovina's number one crime drama, you can safely and easily. And you can use your account across multiple devices to run up to six connections simultaneously. And if you have questions, customer support runs 24 seven. If you click the link in the description, nordvpn.com slash chainbear, you'll get a big old discount on a two year subscription. Nice. Now back to the weirdness of London. Aside from a couple of exceptions, particularly around navigating the pandemic, Formula E takes place in cities, not custom-built, ready-to-go racetracks. And with that comes logistical headaches and a lot of planning, as cities tend not to have a lot of free space available to transform into racing facilities. I spoke to Oli McCrodden, Formula E City Development Director and the Event Director for the London E Prix. You were absolutely right, the logistics. What's the space available? Mm -hmm. um, can we build a track, but more importantly, can we also build a pit lane? And if we can't build a pit lane, is there anything novel that we can do about it, like sticking it in an exhibition center in Bern <laughs> or doing a, a remote uh, pit lane and paddock in Montreal and, and doing things like that? Formula E likes its circuits to be two and a half to three kilometers long with tracks wide enough to go racing in a safe and entertaining way. We know very well the parameters of cars, so we start to look at some of the speed impacts mm -hmm. and speed um, simulations to, to understand you know, how safe the track design is going to be. And uh, we work closely with the FIA Circuit Commission on, on those details. And then, of course, there's everything surrounding the racetrack itself. The grandstands, the Alliance E-Village, hospitality, all the things that bring fans and partners to the event and essentially pay for a lot of what they do. In its first two seasons, Formula E used to race in Battersea Park. It was bumpy, tight and had very little room for overtaking, though it did provide an incredible season finale as the two championship contenders collided on the first lap. Wandsworth Council loved hosting the race as it netted them almost $3 million over the first two seasons, but local residents were in arms. Not over the sound of the cars, of course, but the constant TV helicopters covering the action. After a bit of a vicious fight, the race was discontinued after just those two seasons. So what brought us to Excel? Well, interestingly, sketches have been drawn up around hosting a race at the Excel Centre since season two, when Formula E were well aware that their time at Battersea Park was becoming untenable. Um, we, we were looking around even back then because we, we, need, we knew we needed an alternative. Um, it was a bit too much for everybody to get their heads around, to be honest with you. It was a little bit too out there for the FIA and us to look at and go, yeah, running a track through a building. Mm, not, yeah, it, it was just a bit too much. So Formula E continued to explore ways of returning to racing in London, launching feasibility studies on around 14 locations, including Alexander Palace, REF Northolt and Greenwich Park. 
we had a, a great one um, around St. James's Park, which would be wow. like the ultimate with the palace in the background. And it's, you know, our plan was to put the paddock down on uh, on Horse Guards Parade. And uh, you, you finish the race, you go under Admiralty Arch, turn left onto Trafalgar Square and do the <laughs> podium and have the e-village there. And, and you know, we, we worked on that for quite a bit of time and we were looking at how to make sure that the changing of the guard fitted in and it worked <laughs> in our schedules, everything was there. But unfortunately, the Royal Parks um, felt that that was a little bit too far as well. So, you know, another one went by the way. But as they kept balancing the good and the bad across their many proposed ideas in London, they kept coming back here to the Excel Centre. It's not a typical racetrack, it's not a typical venue, but once we had figured out how we could get the required grip levels inside the hall and that everything would work inside that part of the track, and uh, we worked with the FIA to understand the, the widths that we had and, and how to get the percentage of, of narrow sections down to a, a tolerance that the FIA would, would, would accept. There are two standout features of this circuit. The most obvious, is that part of it runs indoors. Now, cars without emissions easily allow for this. And there are lots of fascinating and interesting opportunities that come from this, and not just as a place to keep the fans and VIPs dry when the great British weather plays up. We can do some amazing things with the grid, you know, and we are planning on doing it here this year. You know, we, I was in there about half an hour ago and uh, some of the lights were being tested above it. You know, we could create something really spectacular that hadn't been seen before in motorsport, notwithstanding the fact that it's a grid and a pit lane inside a building, you know, <laughs> you can start to really jazz up the grid process. But bringing a race to an exhibition center comes with its own problems to solve. The floors here are way too slippery for a racing car? So uh, the, the floor of the halls are a, um, a pre-tensioned concrete slab, basically. And um, as the venue, it has, they've painted it, so it's it's nice sort of shiny, black, <laughs> smooth floor. And you're absolutely right, the grip levels are, are not appropriate for <laughs> the race. So the technical team, including Simon Gibbons, the track architect, set to work on finding solutions. But where do you start? This still has to be an exhibition centre when it's not running a race one weekend a year. What do you do about this shiny concrete? You couldn't dig into it. And, and of course, we couldn't just lay new asphalt down on the top because we would have to skim it off year on year. Sustainability wise, that's not the way to go. And we couldn't leave it in place, of course, because the venue need to push stuff over it. You know, exhibitions have to take place on top of it. So in the area where the track and the pit lane were gonna go, they captive blasted two and a half millimeters off the surface of this concrete, essentially using a floor sander with a vacuum attached. They then lay down a bonding agent across the shaved concrete and essentially spray emery over the top. Emery is a very abrasive rock, finely ground down to a sand-like fineness. You'll often see it on certain grades of sandpaper. The emery is then bonded into the concrete and the whole thing is sealed in with a polymer coating, thus creating a track surface with acquired slip value ratio needed by the FIA for racing circuits without disrupting the venue for the rest of the year. And when you run your hand over it, you need to be a little careful because it could take the skin off your fingers. It's, it's that abrasive. The second standout feature of this track is that it takes place over two floors. Most of the track is on ground level. The grid, pit lane and the first three corners are all on the first floor of the Excel Centre. Or the second floor, if you use the sensible non-British way of counting floors. The cars re-enter the Excel via this ramp at turn 20 at the end of the track. And then the cars exit the Excel at turn four before negotiating a very tight turn five and then heading down this ramp back towards ground level. It's, it, it, was, it was a challenge and um, we had to widen things there because there are curbs that uh, were in place that, uh, that meant we needed to take those out and, and steal a bit of width where we could do. The, the, the challenge on that particular ramp is that it's, again, it's, it's cast and uh, there are weight loading limits on it. So the run from turn four all the way down the ramp couldn't be tarmacked over, as that would be way too heavy. So two years ago, they gave that whole section the shave and emery treatment, just as they did inside. 
so it has been driven over constantly by trucks and things going into that venue. So we're, we're, we're fairly confident that it's, uh, it's durable. And having removed some of the curbing around this section to add some width, Formula E consulted with the FIA and Motorsport UK to ensure it would all work, and they were good to go. The eagle-eyed among you may have noticed the track being used at this year's e -Prix is different to the design originally released when the Excel project was announced. For starters, the double hairpin at Turn 10 has been reversed. The, the sort of hairpin section on the north side, I'll tell you an interesting story on that one. So my, my father was called Stuart McCrudden. My father was a racing driver. He raced in British saloon cars. He won the 24-hour race at Snetterton driving with Matthew Neal. Uh, back in 1990, he got me into motorsport and, mm -hmm. um, and was was in it. And he passed away a couple of years ago before he could see this this track coming together. But uh, I knew that I needed a bit of extra length on the racetrack, and uh, and I thought, well, I'll put a big S in there and have mm -hmm. it sort of in in memoriam of the old man. Um, but then we showed it to the FIA, and appropriate given the old man was quite quick. They said it was far too fast, so we had to change that setup. The problem was the original run through this section here was far too fast with its quick entry and narrow track and the FIA flagged potential impact speeds of cars losing it in this section. So we needed to slow the cars down and I forget the number but just that sort of left right um, before you get into that section there that was put in uh, because the FIA wanted to, to, to get the cars to slow down a little bit before they go in there. Hence we reprofiled the S into a very conveniently on-brand E and, yes. <laughs> uh, and put that in the right place. So, so that's the reason behind it. And, and it all comes down to, to those parameters, much like in the, in the car park. This east car park section used to fling the cars left before sending them into a series of open right-handers at a fairly wide hairpin left before a fast right-hander sent them up the ramp and back inside. Now they've since transformed turn 16 into this more dramatic hairpin, which allows the cars to regenerate energy, go for an overtake, maybe take this attack mode. They then go into a new chicane designed to slow the cars down before they go up that ramp and back into the hall. Sometimes Formula E fixes its circuit designs onto existing public roads. And other times like Berlin, New York, and here in London, they get to invent a circuit from their imagination within a given open space. And as we've seen, several variations were imagined in the open spaces like this car park or the area behind the exhibition center where the double hairpin sits. I asked Ollie about the differences between essentially drawing a track over existing streets and using open spaces to create a circuit from scratch. It's, it's interesting. I mean, the, we started out and it was all you know, CBD street race. Let's smash it into the into the center. It's disruptive. Everyone takes notice. You know, it, it, and it and it was fantastic. It was it was very it was spectacular. But unlike series that rock up to a permanent track and just plug into all of their facilities, organizing a city race is a lot of work. You have to build everything: the blocks, the fences. You have to cut the timing lines in the streets. You have to build all of the tents for hospitality, the garages. Everything needs to go in there. And to do that in a uh, urban environment is a big ask. So there is a balance the series has to make in terms of making their work a little more manageable if they can give themselves a little more space and potentially operate in a less disruptive way. Not that they want to leave the cities. Part of Formula E's mission is to demonstrate electric vehicles right in urban areas where they're needed most. It's more just placing themselves more conveniently, if need be. We need a bit more space, and you see, you've noticed we will sort of migrate a little bit away from that CBD to these exhibition type areas, maybe to stadia where there is some infrastructure that already exists, where there's a bit of space. We're not giving up on street circuits altogether, you know, we love it. If it can be done, we absolutely want to do it. And with all this space comes the opportunity for change, and this finalized layout as I described earlier out here in the East Car Park, is the perfect configuration for grandstands, TV cameras, and in 2021, attack mode. Had we been in a normal COVID-free year, attack mode might well have been up there inside the exhibition hall. Uh, I think if, you know, and it touches on another point in terms of spectators and spectator numbers, um, 
if we were in a position to have a full spectator load inside the hall, then I suspect we were going to put it on turn 22 on that last corner um, so that people that are in there can, can yeah. see that and, and experience it. Um, the truth is we can't do that under COVID. We can't bring people inside a big hall, um, notwithstanding any freedom day uh, that may or may not exist, right? We're putting attack mode here at turn 16, the big final hairpin. Makes a lot of sense in terms of the viewing spectators, the expected action and being able to capture it all on live TV. And speaking of TV, when designing a city circuit with all the constraints that brings, as well as finding places for the fans, the teams, event operations and marshalling, you also have to consider that it is a TV show. And you need to be able to broadcast every aspect of the race live and clearly. And here at the Excel, there are some challenges. Broadcasting both inside and outside with all the variations in light that that brings is not only an interesting challenge from a technical standpoint, but from a narrative standpoint as well. You want the audience to be able to follow the race, but the lighting can make the cars look very different indoors and outdoors. And if you're more of a casual fan, Formula E need to know you can quickly identify the cars inside and out. There's also the issue of turns 6, 7 and 8, which are not only quite tight from a driving and filming perspective, it's also much darker than the open part of the track. And so once, once we get a, a track design that's essentially approved by the FIA, one of our first ports of call is to, to Formula E TV and we speak to our director and we look at those camera positions that he might want. We have a walk around with him and the team and, uh, and we start looking at it. And then, of course, here, because you're going inside and in that particular little sequence down underneath the, um, the, uh, the undercroft, as we call it, <laughs> um, the lighting levels are, are not right. So for the HD cameras, you need 2000 lux for light levels. Lux is a unit marking visible light intensity over an area. Now it's a logarithmic scale, not linear, so the numbers across the scale appear to increase rapidly. But for some context... A bright, sunshiny day may be as much as 50,000 lux. On a cloudy day, we're looking at about 5,000 lux. A well-lit interior, well, that's about 500 lux. So what do they do inside this hall and down at that little chicane underpass? Well, they light it up like Singapore. So did they succeed in rebooting the London EPRI at the Excel Centre? Well, I think some pretty dodgy racing and even dodgier rule bending overshadowed something quite incredible, honestly. Formula E, in that way that Formula E is wont to do, turned a frankly bonkers idea on paper into a reality. And we got races that saw strategy overtaking some nonsense and a new winner to celebrate. I would imagine there will be some tweaks around energy limits and that chaotic double hairpin before we go green again next year, but I have to say, well done. You pulled off an indoor, outdoor, upstairs, downstairs race, somehow. And the funny thing is, the next visitors to the Excel might never even know we were there. Around there, who knows? <laughs> <laughs>